In my last video about composition and arrangement, I made the maybe controversial statement that composition and music theory, not the same thing. The reason I say this is because I see a lot of videos that seem to conflate the two things and use them almost interchangeably. But in my experience, they are two completely different skill sets. Now, before all of the theory professors start typing furiously below, that's not to say that music theory is useless or doesn't serve an important purpose. It's an analytical process and analyzing music can be very valuable in seeing how music was put together. But in my experience in the academic world, which is where I came from, it always seemed like there was too much of an infatuation or too much emphasis placed on arbitrarily naming everything or putting a label on it or determining how something functioned just for the sake of it. As I once heard a composer say, theorists are kind of like the forensics of the music department. They need a corpse to analyze. Okay, go ahead and type away, theorist. In all seriousness, theory is a helpful thing to know. It's the grammar of music, but just like diagramming sentences is not the same thing as writing a narrative story, music theory is not the same thing as composition. So who am I to make such a bold claim about music theory when every other video you see on YouTube is busy teaching you the circle of fifths? Well, I have a long, long relationship with music theory, going all the way back to the age of eight when I started taking piano lessons. And if you've ever taken piano lessons yourself, you probably know that you have to learn a lot of theory. In fact, my very wise mother knew this and encouraged me to study piano instead of guitar early on because she knew that the way the keyboard is laid out is incredibly helpful in visualizing theory concepts. And that actually proved to be a bigger benefit to me than she ever probably realized as I decided to become a composer later on. But maybe that's another topic for another video in which I can anger all the guitarists who are watching. <sighs> Go ahead and type away, guitarist. Should be quite the comments section. From there, I decided I had not had enough yet and decided to major in piano performance in college. And it turned out that involved even more music theory. This time, entire classes that lasted entire semesters were dedicated to a specific theory topic like form and analysis, counterpoint, 18th century harmony, 19th century harmony, 20th century, you get the idea. And somehow, in spite of all of that theory knowledge that I had amassed over all of those years and decades, I still had no idea where to start when I sat down and actually tried to put pen to staff paper. Like, none. Total paralysis. This really didn't change for me until I started studying composition lessons with an actual real-life composer, Italian-American composer Luigi Zaninelli. And Mr. Z was legit, as the kids say. Do kids say that? Having studied with Scalero in Italy and Minotti at the Curtis Institute. And his approach to music was totally different than anything that I had experienced thus far. I don't think he really cares about synthesizers though, so he's probably not watching this channel. He was the first person to ever tell me that composition was an empirical process. Trial and error. 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 Too many R's for my southern accent. And that seems like a simple concept, but it turned out it was something I really needed to hear because I was starting to think that I was just a moron who was not blessed with the ability to receive inspiration from the heavens that would drift down on a cloud of inspiration. <sighs> I mean, after all, I knew all of this theory, so what was the deal? Well, I had learned a lot of rules, but beyond that, I really didn't know how to apply those rules or why those rules existed in the first place. And beyond the textbook definitions, I wasn't really sure that my theory professors knew either. For example, in part writing early on, they taught me not to write in parallel octaves or parallel fifths, or not to double this note or that note in certain situations. But why? And more importantly, why did I not ever ask why? But it did start to make sense to me as I began to write and study writing myself. If you only have four parts to work with and two of them are the same momentarily, you've weakened the harmony to only three voices at that particular moment and probably drawn the listener's ear there in a place that you probably don't want to. And that is more practical than just learning a bunch of rules arbitrarily that you really have no idea how to apply or why. And it also kind of explains why composers were using these common practices to begin with. It wasn't just because they received their how to be a composer handbook. There are simply ways of doing things that are more effective and less effective. And of course, once we learn why a rule exists, 
When we break them, it seems like we meant to do it. It's intentional, and it's a choice that we've made based on our own taste. Now, it may seem like I'm being unnecessarily hard on music theory here, and that's really not my intention. In fact, I think one of the most beneficial ways that we can use theory is the analyzation of form. And in looking at the great works that precede us, we can learn a tremendous amount about how music is put together successfully and maybe unsuccessfully in some other cases. Of course, that's also a matter of taste, which we won't get into in this video. But I think even this sort of analyzation, analysis, but I think even this sort of analysis can be done in a more practical way than just going through and naming every chord and every passing tone. One of my first compositional assignments from Mr. Z was to take a Bach two-part invention and change all the notes, but keep the rhythms and the form and the structure the same. This was incredibly confusing. I didn't really know why I was doing this. It seemed like a waste of time. Why was I copying box work when I wanted to be making original things that were my own and expressed my own artistic voice? But then at some point as I was actually doing it, the light bulb went off for me in what Mr. Z was actually trying to get me to do. He was simply eliminating variables, so I had less to worry about. And he was at the same time teaching me how one of the great masters of all time put a simple piece together by forcing me to adhere to all of the rhythms and the structure that Bach had already put in place. So I could practice coming up with my own lines and melodic ideas and phrases while not having to worry about any of the other decisions that we would normally have to make and simultaneously learning how the great master himself had put everything together. It was kind of a brilliant and invaluable lesson, and it's something that you can do too, and it doesn't have to be with a Bach two-part invention. Just listen to a piece or a song or a track or whatever that you feel is perfectly structured and perfectly paced. Jot down an A when you hear the first theme or the first section, something you can identify as a musical idea. Then a B when you hear the next that sounds like it's contrasting but still somehow related to the overall piece. Then an A again if the A section comes back. Continue to do that until you have a rough roadmap of the overall form of that piece. Now take that structure and decorate it with your own material. This isn't stealing. This is using a proven formula to eliminate some of your decisions and focus your creative energy. Now, if you wanna see more specific examples of this type of form and analysis, as well as some other compositional techniques that I like to use, I do have a free ebook that looks something like this that you can download absolutely free. It'll be the first link in the description below. At the end of the day, I wouldn't trade all of the theory knowledge that I have, but to be honest, I can't tell you the last time that I micro-analyzed a piece by naming every chord or inversion or passing tone. In fact, I actually think having all of this book knowledge with no idea how to apply it to anything actually clogged things up for me quite a bit and I often found myself envious of artists who had less theory background because they seem less inhibited by all of this book learning that I had uh, spent all of these years acquiring. I guess I was so afraid of doing things the wrong way that I just never did anything. But I guess at some point you have to leave behind the fascination with diagramming sentences and start trying to put your own ideas together to make a compelling story. If you enjoyed this video, you can give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more videos about these kinds of topics, leave me a comment down below. And if you want to learn more about this kind of thing that I would like to continue talking about, you can subscribe to this channel. Bye.